Okay, welcome to the briefing room on this Monday. I'm Devin Dwyer in Washington. Thanks so much for joining us. Great to have Terry Moran here, our senior national correspondent with us. A lot of news to plow through today. Big headlines popping late Friday night uh, with Obamacare. Terry, you followed this case for a long time. A federal district judge, Nor Northern District of Texas, struck down Obamacare in its entirety. Take a look at what Judge Reed O'Connor had to say, uh, focusing on the concept of the individual mandate, the requirement that all Americans must purchase health insurance or pay a penalty. Uh, Judge O'Connor wrote, the court finds the individual mandate can no longer be fairly read as an exercise of Congress's tax power. It's impermissible under the Interstate Commerce Clause. The individual mandate is unconstitutional, he said, and also the entire thing with it. He said the former enacted the ACA, that was the 2010 law, the latter, what Congress did this past year, sawed off the last leg. What Congress did, Terry, was eliminate the mandate in effect. Uh, but it, a lot of people asking today, didn't we already go through this with the Supreme Court in 2012? You were there, you know, what gifts? It does feel like we've seen this movie before, and we have. However, there is this new wrinkle. So think of it as a, as a Jenga puzzle, right? Mm -hmm. that, that the Obamacare <laughs> was like a Jenga puzzle. And the Republicans, because actually they don't have their own plan and never have in any defined sense. They just want to knock this thing down, but you can't so, because they don't have the votes. So they took out one piece after another. Last year, so if you remember, they had an, a full frontal assault in the Supreme Court. Right, that was the famous John McCain thumbs John down. McC it didn't work. Right, right. So then right. they went to plan B. Plan B was, well, we'll just take the Jenga piece of the tax, which is the penalty if you don't get individual health insurance, we'll take that out. And then we'll bring a court case saying you can bring the whole thing down. Because here's the way it worked. So the, the original Obamacare was you must buy he health care or you will be penalized. And the Republicans said, you can't, you can't do that on the Constitution. Mm -hmm. They went to the Supreme Court. John Roberts said, you're right. You can't penalize people, but you can tax them differently. So with a little bit of slate of hand as a judge, he changed the penalty into a tax, making it constitutional. Last year, the Republicans took that tax out and the Jenga puzzle came down according to this judge. The whole thing collapsed. Two pieces there, though. He said that the individual mandate, now not a tax, uh, makes it unconstitutional, but also that it's inseverable from the rest of the law, and the whole thing can't stand if you cut that leg off, as you say, the Jenga piece. So, so a lot to unpack, though. a lot at stake. Let's bring in uh, Jonathan Gruber. He was one of the architects uh, of uh, Romney Care in Massachusetts in 2006, also one of the advisors of the Obama administration in 2010 when they wrote the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Jonathan Gruber, now a professor of economics at MIT, thanks so much uh, for coming on the briefing room. My pleasure. So I want to start, uh, uh, Jonathan, with, with just your take on what's at stake here. So many people today sort of scratching their heads, saying, I thought we already went through this with the courts. Um, but if this is struck down, what would it mean for our health care as Americans? Let's start in the short run. What's at stake right now today is nothing. Nothing has changed. The earliest anything would change would be the spring of 2020, when the Supreme Court might take this decision. However, if they decide to strike this down, what's at risk is enormous, both for individual health and the health of our democracy. What I mean by that for individual health is if the ACA goes away, that means 17 million people lose health insurance. That means the 133 million Americans with pre-existing conditions can now be denied insurance because of those conditions. That means that those under age 26 can no longer get health insurance on their parents' plan. That means there's no more caps on what you have to pay out of pocket of health insurance. This is a broad-reaching law which has fundamentally changed U.S. health care. And what's crazy about this decision is the notion that in some sense, because this one piece is taken away, the whole law has to come down. And the reason that's crazy, and I'm not alone on this, is what legal experts are saying, is because Congress has spoken. Congress had the chance to repeal this law. They didn't. They instead just took away the individual mandate penalty. So Congress has said the law can exist without the penalty. This judge is essentially saying, I don't like what Congress said. I'm going to decide differently. And that is why legal experts, including the lawyers who brought the previous cases to the Supreme Court say this is a ridiculous abuse of judicial power. Let's unpack that a little bit, Jonathan, because at one point, um, as we said, you were one of the champions of the individual mandate. You, yes. Uh, you've called it essential, in many, uh, many ways inseverable from the rest of the law, so we can avoid the free rider problem, people without insurance benefiting uh, from everybody else. But now you, you're, you're sort of telling us a, a different tune with this analysis. You're saying the law can stand, it can work without the individual mandate? 
Well, first of all, I never said the word inseparable, so let's be clear, <laughs> but it was essential. It, it, it was absolutely essential. I viewed it as essential, many experts viewed it as essential, and I think uh, it is important. The law is weaker without the mandate. I think what, quite frankly, we got a bit wrong is that the rest of the law is stronger than we thought without the mandate. In mm. Massachusetts, mm. this law was based on the mandate was essential, and the mandate was successful. Federally, the mandate's never really been accepted at the national level the way it was in Massachusetts. At the federal level, much more of the law was supported by the Medicaid expansions, which really have nothing to do with the mandate, which, through which about two-thirds of individuals have gained coverage. And second of all, the tax subsidies at the federal level have been sufficiently generous. The individuals have wanted insurance coverage, even if it's not mandated. And look, at the end of the day, you have to respect the evidence. And the evidence is we took away the individual mandate, and the law didn't collapse. We've taken away the individual mandate, and enrollment fell, premiums went up, so it was a bad thing to take it away, but the law did not collapse. And, you know, I, I think we can all have our preconceived notions, but at the end, we have to respect the evidence. And Jonathan makes a great point. This was an act of judicial activism. The elected Democratic representatives, Democratic Republicans, but the elected representatives of the people said, we can do this. We can take this, uh, this tax out, and it will stand. But that does raise the question, Jonathan, this is Terry Moran, where you, where you did... You did touch on it. What do you expect to happen? Is this yet another? It, it, it's like death by a thousand cuts with the Republicans, right? They, in the states, they don't adopt the provisions. The, the markets aren't aren't operative in some states where the governors wouldn't wouldn't put them in place. And now this, is this law staggering along? And what will the absence, even if the court says some of the law can stand, but we can take the rest of it out, what would happen? So basically, look, the law is currently less effective than is written. It's less effective than is written for a couple of reasons. First of all, the law includes the right for states, with federal government paying for it, to expand their Medicaid program to the lowest income citizens. Unbelievably, about 17 states have still refused to accept money from other states so they can provide insurance to their lowest income citizens. That's costing us coverage. The Trump administration has injected enormous uncertainty into the exchange markets. They still exist in every state. You said they, did, they do exist in every state. They're still functional in every state. But premiums are higher because of the uncertainty that's been injected. Mm -hmm. So the law is not working as designed. But it's still better than what we had before. We're still in a world, most importantly, I cannot emphasize this enough, we are, have avoided the world that we're in before 2010, where someone who was sick could be turned down for health insurance just because they were sick. That is insane. Okay, if you talk to people in other countries, the notion the developed country could have an insurance system where insurers can turn you down because you're sick violates the norms of what a developed country should be about. And that ended uh, in 2014 when those regulations went in place. And that is fundamentally what's at risk here. All right, Jonathan Gruber, professor of economics at MIT. Thanks so much for coming in the briefing room. Appreciate your expertise, Jonathan. Thank you. My pleasure. And, Thanks for and Terry, the, the politics of this are also fascinating. The president tweeting over the weekend, sort of celebrating this, but uh, a lot of Republicans thinking twice about uh, about all this. Sort of careful what what you wish for. Um, there isn't a Plan B. Only Congress, as Jonathan was saying, can enact a Plan B. Perhaps the silver lining in this, as the president suggests, is that this could kind of turn up the heat on Congress to get something done. But it's an, we're in election season, right? And and this is a Congress which can't keep the government running. It seems. Refashioning health care again uh, by, in a bipartisan and it didn't way work with, with President Republicans Trump. It's, in, in, in full control. One of the problems with the Republican campaign is, is that they've been against something and not for something. They talk about some principles that they have, but there's actually no Republican plan. This was a drive uh, to undo Obamacare, which was an innovative. A program in, in American law. Only one time in history had the Congress ever required Americans to buy something. And that was in the 1790s when the Congress uh, required citizens, they were all men at the time, to buy a musket, uh, gunpowder, and some ammunition as well. So it was an innovation, but they also wanted to erase Obama's legacy. And, and there's something so uh, destructive about that, that the constructive thing, which is now desperately needed, if, at the very least, to repair Obama, uh, health care in America, if not to replace the system that we have, if the courts uphold this decision, they don't have a plan B. Those appeals now headed for the Fifth Circuit in New Orleans. We'll stay on the case for more on what this means for you right now. Go to abcnews.com. We have a great explainer up there on how this Obamacare ruling impacts uh, your health care.
Moving on, though, another major story popping this morning in all the papers here in Washington. You may have heard enough about Russia, uh, but there is a new, two new reports out prepared for the Senate Intelligence Committee that are putting together pieces of the puzzle for the first time in the most comprehensive fashion uh, that we have seen on just how extensively the Russians meddled uh, in the 2016 campaign. Some surprising findings here. The group spent months analyzing the ads and data that uh, were gathered in the, in the course of the investigation. They found out that every social media platform in America was used and there was a fixation on African Americans specifically. That's one of the new findings. Let's bring in now one of the authors uh, of that report, Renee DeResta. She's the director of research uh, at New Knowledge, one of the groups that uh, produce these independent reports for the Senate uh, Intelligence Committee. She also is an investigator tracking down malign actors online. Renee, thanks so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. So what surprised you most about uh, this eight months long, seven, eight months long project looking into this? Once you got everything together, what stood out most to you? I think it's that we originally thought when we were looking at just the stuff that people were finding online that this was a social media marketing operation. And then when we had access to the full scope of the 175,000 or so memes, it really became obvious that they were doing a lot of direct outreach, uh, direct infiltration of communities, um, really working to connect with real Americans, working to, in some cases, hire them on to their fake media properties, their fake page Black Matters, for example. They were looking for designers and writers and people to photograph protests. Uh, they also did a lot of exploitation. They created hotlines for people who had, um, you know, who were LGBT questioning and ashamed, who were, um, you know, religious but felt that they were behaving badly uh, or had some sort of um, you know, sexual misconduct issues. So there was a lot of this really human psychology that, that went into a lot of the, the content that they were putting out. It wasn't just blasting out political memes. Yeah, and specifically targeting, tailoring the black community. I find that just fascinating. Tell us a little bit more about that. How, did, how were you able to divine that the African American community was sort of uh, singled out for, for special attention? So we looked at the rough focus of the pages. And of course, there's some subjectivity to that, but it's a question of um, what is the message and who are they putting it out to. And this stuff does look a lot like American media. So there were uh, pages that were clearly targeting left-wing audiences, like with names like Born Liberal, um, LGBT United. There were pages that were clearly targeting right-wing audiences, um, Stop All Invaders, Being Patriotic, Heart of Texas. And then there was about 30 pages just on Facebook, not including the dozens of accounts on Instagram, that had names with black in them. So Blacktivist, Blackstagram, um, Black for Black, Black for uh, Black Matters. So they had an entire cluster of about um, 30 Facebook pages alone solely targeting the black community. Uh, with cultural content, with uh, religious-related content, with political content, uh, different collections of topics that would be appealing to different you know, people with different interests in the black community. And, and is there, there any is there any any doubt in your mind though that this effort was was tailored to hurt uh, support for Hillary Clinton and uh, feed support for President Trump, can, candidate Trump? It was absolutely tailored to, uh, to harm Secretary Clinton. So what they did was, uh, for the right-wing pages, they were, of course, vehemently uh, anti-Secretary Clinton and very pro-Donald Trump. Uh, for the left-wing pages, they were not pro-Donald Trump. They were, of course, still uh, anti-Trump because this was a, you know, they had to make the content fit the audience. But they were pro-Jill Stein in the primary, pro-Bernie mm. Sanders. The black community was hit with suppression narratives in addition to the uh, pro Jill Stein, it was uh, you. Sh we shouldn't vote because this is not our country. Um, we are outsiders in this country. We shouldn't participate in the voting process. I'm going to boycott the election. And then on Twitter, that extended into uh, narratives about you know just kind of things that were blatantly wrong. Oh, if you voted in the primary for this candidate, you can't vote for this other candidate. Or um, misleading information about polls, about election designs, that sort of stuff. So there were, it was really, the black community was targeted to the greatest extent with these suppression narratives. The other two groups were not. Terry, how do we find ourselves here? Why are we so susceptible? I mean, uh, the president has pushed back against the idea that any of this campaign had any impact. But it's clear from these reports that millions of people subscribed to these pages, followed these tweets, read these Instagrams. Um, and you got to believe that some of that seeped in somewhere. And, and that is that uh, that's the $64,000 question. It's hard to answer what would have happened without it. But we are all hardwired in our own software 
uh, to believe the stuff that, that flatters our own ideas, right, that, that makes us feel good or feel angry, so, rather than stuff which is true. We're, we're and, drawn to the things that we have an affinity with. Exactly. Yeah. And the power of social media and the algorithms that drive it and now the ability of commercial corporations, news media and adversaries to manipulate those algorithms. It reminds me that there's an old Stephen King story of a guy who could read minds and he starts dating a girl and he can read her mind and he doesn't tell her. And her friend finds out and says, you aren't in love with her, you're controlling her. And that is essentially where we're at. And that's what Putin wants. Of course, he wants these separatist narratives. He wants everybody separate into their little cantons, except for Russia. Mother Russia always has to stay together. But uh, it plays right into his hands. And at the end of the day, it's the responsibility of candidates to make better arguments than the Russians. And that is something Hillary Clinton failed to and do. And dominate that space. Renee DeResta with new knowledge. Um, are you confident we're, we're prepared to better protect ourselves in the next election, based on what you've seen? I think we did a pretty good job in 2018. I think that we have to think of this as a constant chronic problem. There's always going to be social media, and there's always going to be people trying to manipulate social media. So really having the government, researchers, and tech companies work together to solve the problem is uh, where we need to be. All right, thank you so much, Renee DeResta, the Director of Research at New Knowledge, one of the authors of, of those new reports shedding light on the Russian involvement in the 2016 campaign. Thanks so much for coming in. Uh, fascinating story. Much more again at abcnews.com. want to shift gears now to another major story. This is, um, this is quite something. I want to bring in our Martha Raddatz, uh, Martha. senior you, Martha. Uh, foreign yeah. correspondent. Yeah. Great to have you, Martha. Thanks. Tell us about this story involving a former Army Green Beret getting some attention over the weekend from President Trump uh, on trial for murder. And the president says, I might pardon you. What's what's going on with this guy? Well, well, first of all, let's, let's talk about him. His, his name is Major Matt Goldstein. And he was a Green Beret, as you said. He was also the recipient of a Silver Star. Um, so a, decorated Valor, a decorated Army major, a decorated Army major in Afghanistan. He was in Afghanistan, a very, very deadly period. A lot of people were getting blown up. He found out about a bomb maker. Uh, there were a lot of roadside bombs going off and IEDs. And this bomb maker, maker suspected bomb maker, uh, they detained. And according to the Army, and there are several different narratives here, according to Army documents, uh, what happened was he was concerned, the Major was concerned that this guy would be released and come back and kill an informant. So they say he took care of it himself, and this started in about 2011 because they found out that he had applied for a job at the CIA. And when he was taking a polygraph test, he said, yeah, I killed this guy, and then mm. I buried this guy, and then we mm. dug him up and took him back to the base and put him in a burn pit and burned him. Now, his lawyer, uh, Major Goldstein's lawyer, said, no, 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 it didn't happen that way. But then in 2016, he was asked by Brett Baer on a Fox News interview. You got and it we here? Have it. Okay. Let's take a listen. So this is Major Goldstein answering the question if he actually killed this Taliban suspected bomb maker. Take a listen. Did you kill the Taliban bomb maker? Yes. You willingly offered up these details right. at the CIA, right? That's correct. And that's where it all started? Pretty much. I never say begrudged investigators or even my commanders for doing an investigation if they're concerned about my judgment or my behavior, then, then I would expect that they would look into it. What is it like going from war hero to accused war criminal? Are you angry? No. It has been incredibly painful and very difficult. Over the last years, everyone who served with me stood by me. And so it's over and yeah, it's time to move on. on. So some people, Martha, might say, look, I mean, this is a war zone. This was a bomb maker. What's the big deal if he uh, went out and took care of this guy? Well, there is a catch, though. Well, yeah, there's a catch. First of all, he was talking about the previous investigation when they first looked at it after what he said to the CIA. And they took his Silver Star away, um, and they gave him a letter of reprimand, but they couldn't prove what had actually happened. 
Then that interview takes place. They open up the investigation again, and now they are saying it is premeditated murder. Look, you can't go around <laughs> killing detainees. That's so the issue was you that this not... guy was in U.S. custody. The army says he was he was he was a captive. He was a prisoner. You can't take him out in the field when you've got him in cuffs and take. Or care. even as as his lawyers now saying he was worried he was released or he was released. It's very unclear exactly what they mean by this. They say, oh, he died during an ambush. Um, if he was unarmed, I mean, you just can't shoot. So, so There's, there it, are rules of engagement. What would it mean if the president were to come in and pardon this? What, what message does that send? I, I think one of the things that people are looking at now is un, unlawful command influence. And what that means is if you are a commander and those under you hear how you feel about a case. I mean, remember, this will be tried in the military. So if the commander-in-chief comes in and says, hey, I'm going to take a look at this war hero, and I think the war hero part is what really got the red flags up against, uh, with a lot of lawyers saying that could be command influence because those people who are looking at the case, wait, hmm. the commander in chief says so what's the he's next a war step hero. Here? So I think the next step is they, it, you know, Donald Trump can pardon him. He certainly can't pardon him. But I think what the what the army wants to do, what the military wants to do, is let this go to trial and let's see what really happened and what kind of evidence there is, let this play out in the courts without influence. And Martha, well, what do you make of the argument that, look, it's an, those rules of engagement, the Geneva Conventions, all those things, that's a different world. We live in this savage world right now. There's beheaders out there and all that stuff. These, they're planting bombs, blowing up buses, the whole deal. Uh, they no longer apply. What, what's the utility of them? in a world without any boundaries in well, conflict. Well, well, I think if you look at those rules, those rules are there for a reason. What if what if one of our people mm -hmm. was captured and somebody decided, wait a minute, he's going to do something bad, let's just, I mean, obviously they do do that. Yeah. We just don't want to condone that with our own behavior. You know, America's always set the example on, on these issues and uh, we'll hope to see that this plays out uh, in court. Martha Roddits, thank you so much. You got it, thanks. Uh, moving on, though, we do see we are four days now from a potential partial government shutdown. Uh, just before Christmas time. Uh, here's what's at stake. Take a look. Uh, with the government shutdown looming, 25% of the federal government could shut down. 75% uh, of it's actually been funded into next year, so that's the good news there. But on, 20, on uh, Saturday morning, December 22nd, uh, about a quarter uh, will shut down. It affects nine of 15 federal departments. 420,000 workers uh, would be deemed essential. They'd stay on the job, but they'd have to work without pay just around Christmas time. 380000 would be put off without pay. And look at this, Terry. Here's the actual impact in your pocketbook. $500 a week. Mm. Uh, the leading government union says their workers pay. So that's a lot of money right at the holidays for those workers, even if they'll get pay paid back later. Uh, the cash not coming in, not a good thing. Uh, let's bring in our Ben Siegel, who's up on Capitol Hill for the latest. Ben, what are you hearing? Give us the minute-by-minute -minute state of play. Are we going to see a shutdown on Saturday morning? Well, Devin, there's a lot of excitement here, uh, obviously anticipation of what will happen, whether or not there will be a shutdown. It's actually strangely pretty quiet. The House has sent home members until Wednesday, oh, uh, meaning that any sort of deal to pass uh, government funding can't happen until then. Um, and at this point, we haven't seen uh, Democrats or the president budge from their corners uh, towards making a deal. I spoke to one Republican aide uh, this morning who made the point of, I asked if uh, the president if they thought the president was in a, in a mood to negotiate. And he said, uh, you wouldn't have put Stephen Miller, one of your most hardline immigration advisors, on TV like the president did yesterday if you were in a negotiating mood. So what's on the table, Ben? I've, I've seen a couple of ideas floating. We do know they're trying to get some negotiations. It's all around, about border wall money, right? Right. This is exclusively about the border wall and how much uh, Congress is willing to give President Trump for that wall, which Democrats keep noting. Uh, he said Mexico would pay for it during the campaign trail. They're not feeling very charitable. They are have a offer standing for uh, $1.6 billion uh, in this deal, uh, which they say is more than enough to beat, beef up current border security. Uh, they do not want that for a wall. While President Trump has his, uh, his negotiating offer at $5 billion and uh, seems unwilling to move down from that. So we're still at a bit of an impasse. The question is maybe how long of a shutdown 
do we have? How long of a temporary funding measure do we have? Democrats want to go until September. Uh, the president possibly uh, a little bit more of a short-term agreement, so that also remains to be seen. All right, Ben Siegel on the Hill with the latest. I know you're keeping a close eye on it, Ben. We've got four days to go, so we'll see if they can work this out and get home for a happy holidays. Thanks so much, Ben. Terry, the political calculations of the past have always hurt, shutdowns have hurt the party in power. Do you think the same thing holds here? Will Republicans pay a price? Well, one of the things that President Trump is sure of is that it will help him with his base, and maybe we live in a base election world, mm. that the whole game is to get your own people to the polls, and he's determined to awaken them and, and inspire them with border security. But really, this is no way to run a popsicle stand. I mean, it's just <laughs> not. <laughs> on that analogy, we'll end the breaking room for today. By the way, keep a close eye on the Dow. It's down nearly 600 points right now. We'll have much more uh, on the financial story uh, playing out today on World News Tonight and World News Prime here uh, at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on ABC News Live. Great to have Terry with us today. Thank you for watching us today. I'm Devin Dwyer in Washington. We'll see you next time.